Today's presentation is the second in our series on critical manufacturing practices produced in collaboration with PRI's MediCred program, and it is on heat treating. I'm Courtney Stevens, an attorney in Medmark's Risk Management Department. On behalf of Medmark and today's presenters, Bruce Stahl, Edward Engelhart, and Marcel Cooperman, thank you for joining us. Bruce is the Senior Metallurgist for Striker Global, Striker Global Supply, and he's also the Chairman of the MediCred Heat Treatment Task Group. Ed is the Vice President of Corporate Quality for Solar Atmospheres, and Marcel Cooperman is a Staff Engineer for PRI with 32 years of experience in the heat treating industry. I will now think, hand things over to Marcel, who will begin today's presentation. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Marcel Kirman, the Senior Staff Engineer for Heat Treating for Medacred. Um, on uh, today's webinar, okay, we're going to discuss about some critical process parameters for heat treating, uh, some product non-conformance reports due to the heat treating, some recall examples at, um, uh, nationwide, the technical standards, top audit NCRs, non-conformance reports, typical initial root cause responses, and what is the medical device industry doing to improve heat treating quality and supply chain oversight? The next slide, please. Uh, everybody involved in the heat treating uh, knows that this is a critical manufacturing process. For metals industry, it doesn't matter which industry, either it's uh, medical devices, it's uh, aerospace industry, naval industry, automotive industry, heat treating a metal, okay, it's a very, very important process. Um, the heat treating will require to have best process controls to assure quality of the product, a consistency product from uh, cycle to cycle for each alloy, the cycles need to be consistent, safety of the product, and we are speaking here of the product that is used in the medical devices, sometimes inserted in the body, and the reliability and the trust of the industry, of all the medical industry, that the product has been heat treated properly. On the next slide, please, uh, you can see some uh, examples of the FDA product failure recalls nationwide due to some causes including, but not uh, always, heat treating. So Medline guide wire with flaking coatings. The coating applied on the guide wire is many times is post-coated heat treated, and the heat treating can have effect on this coating. That coating was flaking off and some steel rust in the hot spiral injections. <clears throat> Particle of oxide stainless steel found in the container of a cardiac drug. And this is a proper, improper heat treating and post heat treating protection. These are just two examples, okay? There are many other examples that heat treating can be um, a, a culprit for this um, failures. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Okay, now, heat treating, as we said, okay, it's a critical process um, in, the, in the industry. And during the heat treating, there are parameters that need to be controlled. Um, the supplier using heat treating, okay, needs to control these parameters. And during the audits, MediCred auditors, okay, uh, ensure that the supplier is following the parameters. For the heat treating, temperature is one of the most important parameters. We know that we cannot have variations on the temperatures up and down. We have to keep it consistent within the sun limits. The time at temperature is also an important aspect of the heat treating because from product to product, from the same alloy to same alloy, you cannot keep one alloy one hour, the other one two hours, the other one three hours. You have to be consistency on the process, on the, on the parameters kept during the heat treating. Atmosphere used to protect the alloy, to protect the metal for surf, from surface contamination. And many alloys are... Uh, heat treated in the atmosphere, control atmosphere, including the vacuum, which is also an atmosphere. Uh, pressure 
pressure in the furnace using atmosphere, endothermic or exothermic atmosphere, needs always to be positive pressure to prevent the air going into the furnace. And in this case, the alloy surface contamination will be protected. And the cooling rates. The cooling rates is important for many alloys, stainless steels, nickel-based alloys, titanium, aluminum alloys, okay, because the cooling will um, uh, ensure that the structure of the alloy, okay, is kept intact from the time of the heat treating performed with that alloy. Um, I'm... Uh, I, I, I need to pass uh, the next slide to our uh, heat treating to our heat treating chair uh, to our to Ed, Edward Engelhardt, okay, which will present some critical process execution. Uh, Edward is uh, very much involved with the medical accreditation um, audits. Ed. Yes. So, <clears throat> following up on uh, Marcel's. Uh, discussion of the critical process parameters, when the product arrives at the heat treater, uh, not only does he have to meet all the uh, previously mentioned requirements, but he has to have an environment in which he can conduct reliable, consistent heat treating in. So to that end, the heat treat processor has to uh, provide appropriate training for personnel. He has to assure that only qualified operators uh, manipulate and handle the work for which they are approved. He has to assure that the equipment being used is appropriately validated and that predominantly that will involve pyrometric work, such as uh, control of uh, thermocouples used to measure temperature, uh, the instrumentation used to display and record temperature, and periodic tests to make sure that all systems operate accurately. Uh, also, the heat treat processor has to provide an appropriately clean environment in which to conduct the product so as to prevent uh, undue contamination from sources, not only from possible furnace issues, but even in the ambient environment and uh, foreign object debris. Uh, part of the processing would include uh, detailed instructions to go to the operators where these various facets are controlled on a product-by-product -product basis and in particular, the critical nature of loading parts in order to assure proper circulation of the atmosphere, uh, being able to meet cooling requirements, and to minimize distortion that might occur. In addition to all this, records have to be produced and kept and monitored to assure that all the product uh, is receiving the um, specified process requirements. And then finally, testing that's appropriate to the product has to be uh, uh, conducted and a record made of that as well. During a Metacred audit, several jobs are audited in great detail by the auditor to assure that under various materials, processes, and pieces of equipment used, the processing meets all requirements. And you're going to now pass this on to Bruce, please. Good afternoon. So, um, uh, regarding product nonconformances, uh, the, the reason that heat treat is typically performed um, on products uh, is to elicit specific properties from them. Uh, oftentimes, uh, heat treatment will be done to strengthen a material or to increase its toughness, um, but it can also be done to make it softer and more formable. Um, and it's really, a, on a fundamental level, what the heat treatment is doing is uh, manipulating the internal structures. Uh, of the metallic materials um, and, uh, and changing the chemical arrangements of the metal. Uh, and it is these structures and chemistry um, that ultimately are responsible for the, fi the final properties um, of the material that's being used. Um, therefore, um, if you fail to achieve any of these uh, critical process parameters that uh, we discussed earlier in the presentation, um, it's very um, uh, possible that you could end up with unexpected final properties in your material. Um, and certain properties can be easily tested, but many of these properties um, are more challenging to test on a routine production basis um, and can easily go undetected, uh, which makes the process controls uh, that Ed just talked about all the more critical in uh, ensuring that you have a good quality product coming out of heat treatment. Um, 
So here on the slide, we have some examples of uh, what can go wrong during heat treatment um, from a product and material perspective. Um, and you notice these can affect both the mechanical properties as well as other properties such as corrosion resistance of the material. Um, grain size or grain growth, this is a condition where the uh, internal structure grows uh, at an uncontrolled rate, uh, typically during um, uncontrolled high temperature exposures. Um, intergranular corrosion, a uh, picture of this is on the right of the screen. And uh, what this is is a uh, chemical segregation um, at, uh, along with some internal structures uh, which reduce the corrosion resistance uh, of the material um, in those areas uh, and can affect both mechanical uh, and corrosion resistance of, uh, of the material. Uh, voids can occur during joining operations such as brazing, um, as well as cracks. Uh, some materials are very sensitive to the cooling rates uh, and cooling and processing conditions that they're exposed to um, at these temperatures, and uh, cracking can, ensure if you are, can occur if you don't follow the proper heat treatment procedures. Um, modern heat treatment processes uh, have really been engineered uh, to avoid a lot of these problems um, uh, and the processing parameters that Marcel talked about really have been well established for most material systems. So it's really at this point up to the, uh, the OEMs to establish the heat treat parameters that they need uh, to succeed in their designs, and it's up to the uh, suppliers of heat treatment to execute on those uh, uh, critical process parameters uh, perfectly every time um, in order to assure we have quality product. And so now what I'll do is I'll hand it over to Marcel to talk more about some of the technical standards um, that uh, can be invoked to ensure that um, um, quality product is achieved and compliance is maintained. Thank you, Bruce. Um, there are requirements coming from the OEMs down, flow down to the suppliers. And these requirements are either in the specifications or in the blueprint or in the purchase orders or some other means of flowing down the requirements from the, supply, from the OEMs to the supplier. So there are customer standards or industry standards, okay? Uh, each heat treating has a standard. Each alloy heat treated has a standard. And those standards for the, uh, for the critical process for heat treating, okay, we can really focus on three types of standards. The proper standards for heat treating, which each alloy, okay, uh, is the, uh, designated to. A pyrometry standard, to control the uh, equipment, and the testing standards. If we are talking about the heat treating standards, as I said, these are designed by the customers, by OEMs, or they are designed by entire industry. For pyrometry, for testing of the equipment, uh, Medicred decided okay, to adopt AMS 2750. This is a standard borrowed from the aerospace industry and is considered one of the most uh, complex pyrometry standards in the industry right now. And implies four types of compliance tests. is a test applied to thermocouples, tests applied to instruments, to system accuracy tests, and temperature informed tests. Each thermocouple you use it in the um, thermal processing needs to be calibrated and needs to be calibrated eventually in the temperature of use. Uh, there depends of the processes used in the heat treating, okay? There are different types of thermocouples. There are thermocouples that last longer, thermocouples that last short period of time. Based on your process, okay, you're going to choose the thermocouples to use. The instrument calibration are those instruments that control really, okay, the heat treating. They control the furnace, are controlling instruments and recording instruments. They need to be calibrated also on the temperature of use. System accuracy test is a simple test performed to ensure that the temperature measured by a controlling thermocouple or monitoring thermocouple or low thermocouple, okay, it is the real temperature you want to see it. That means the temperature is the real temperature in the furnace. 
So that system will be tested during this SAT, system accuracy test. The entire furnace, the entire volume of the furnace loaded with the parts need to be tested during the temperature uniformity test. You want to ensure that every single point in that qualified working zone has the same temperature, okay, with the tolerance eventually. <clears throat> so it's tested using various number of thermocouples based on the volume of that uh, working zone and measuring through a digital uh, recorder, a data logger, to ensure that the temperature it is accurate, is uniform all over the place. And the last but not least is the testing, <clears throat> sorry, st testing st standards. And this testing normally are done through the hardness testing and tensile testing. These are two types of testing performed for heat treating. And the hardness, STME 10 for Brunel testing, STME 18 for Rockwell testing, and STME 92 for Vickers, for macro Vickers, STME 384 for micro Vickers. And the tensile is most of the time is controlled by the STME 8. In, uh, room temperature tensile. This type of the tests, um, our auditors will verify during the uh, compliance audits for the uh, Medicrat. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> the technical standard compliance will ensure that the process and product quality, okay? As Bruce says, the quality, the mechanical property of the metallic components is influenced a lot by the heat treating. And this will, will also verify that the process is consistent. The same alloy, same product will always get the same properties. And consistency is also verified that the process is validated. Time temperature profiles, an auditor will look to many jobs, okay, uh, during the Medicred audit, there are eight job audits performed, and the auditor will verify the charts, the charts profiles for the time temperature to ensure that the temperature as required was achieved and the time required was also achieved. The recipes for the uh, programs. Many uh, furnaces in the industry right now have recipes and these recipes that always match against detailed work instruction. The work instruction flow down by the supplier based on the customer requirement will also build a recipe, and this recipe will ensure always process consistency. Next slide, please. <coughs> now, we have a, um, a brother program called NATCAP in the industry, for the aerospace industries. Medicred, it has no uh, too much history, uh, one or two years, okay, and uh, we are uh, taking care of Medicred. But we have over 25 years in other program, a similar program, NATCAP. And we saw uh, lots of uh, non-conformances over the year, over these 25 years, and they were summarized in the, in the slide in front of you. What were the top non-conformances in the heat treating audits, okay? And if you are looking to this list, you're gonna see that pyrometry was the main culprit for an audit for the heat treating. Instruments calibration, pyrometry internal procedures that flow down the requirements uh, to, the, to the operators. Um, system accuracy tests on all systems. Uh, the requirements from AMS 2750, as I said, this is the main uh, standard for pyrometry, requires to perform SAT on the controlling and recording systems, while suppliers perform on controlling, do not perform on the uh, recording or the other way around. Okay, uh, instruments calibration, which is number one, Okay, they do not calibrate the instruments on the entire temperature used, okay, on the entire temperature range used. Um, others were temperature informative survey reports. There is a report that contained about 13, 14 items. Some of the items were not included in the report. 
uh, process temperature violations. Uh, this is um, one of the most important because this not only that affect affect the product, okay, but can cause many many problems with the product heat treated, and the temperature temperature and time violations, okay, found during the job audits. Other nonconformances, part of this top nonconformances, were non-sustaining corrective actions. In order to close a nonconformance, supplier needs to respond to a root cause corrective action analysis and to keep the corrective actions over the year, over the years, and from audit to audit. So non-sustaining corrective actions, when the supplier do not keep this non-corrective um, actions, okay, all the time until the next audit. So they will get a repeat finding on the next audit. And last but not least, okay, the customer requirements flow down. The customer requires your temperature to flow down and the supplier actually choose a different temperature or a different time or a different parameter during the job audit. Um, next slide, please. Typical initial root cause responses, okay, every time, as I said, we have a nonconformance report, an NCR, the supplier needs to provide uh, a root cause corrective action analysis. So I, I'll give an example here. Uh, the nonconformance was the parts heat treated outside qualified working zone. Uh, first of all, let's see what is this nonconformance. You have a qualified working zone, right? So that qualified working zone, let's just assume, that has the dimensions, has a length, a width, a depth, a height, okay, so it's a volume. It's a, a volume that where you load the parts. So your qualified working zone, okay, is very well defined. You load the parts, okay, as a supplier, outside. You put a bigger basket to the parts, and some of the parts fall outside of this working zone. The working zone, the limits of a working zone, were uh, controlled and were tested during the temperature informed survey. So outside that working zone, you do not know how much is the temperature. If I give you just an example, in the vacuum furnace, if you go outside the working zone, you are actually approaching the elements. So approaching the elements will cause the temperature to be higher than within the working zone, correct? You are closer to the elements. In this case, your product being heat treated outside that zone, that means that product was overheated, okay? So one of the responses, operator wasn't aware of the requirement. Why wasn't aware of the requirement? Because the engineer did not flow down the requirement to operator, okay? What were the consequences? Parts are not heated uniformly. As I said, they are overheated. Parts fail mechanical properties for the overheating, right? And process product escapes because sometime, okay, you do not test all the parts. Some of the areas of the parts heat treated outside the working zone might not be tested during the hardness testing, or doing some other tensile testing. So you have products sent to the customer that fails the properties. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> okay, I'm gonna pass uh, right now to Bruce and Ed, okay, to <clears throat> tell you what is medical device doing to improve the heat treating quality. Thanks, Marcel. Um, so first of all, large portions of the medical device industry uh, already in understand the importance of uh, heat, treat heat treatment control and supplier management uh, in this area. Um, and for many years now, um, quality OEMs and quality suppliers have been ind independently um, implementing their own versions of uh, process control systems, and many have had a lot of success in this. Um, but what's happened uh, is that we've ended up now with a system where there's uh, little consistency or common methodology amongst OEMs and suppliers when it comes to how to properly um, so one way this is being addressed is uh, within Metacred, the heat treat task group was formed. 
Um, and the goal of this heat treat task group uh, was uh, to focus on standardizing the heat treat processing control requirements um, around these core technical standards and industry best practices uh, that we talked about earlier. Um, in addition, uh, the Metacred um, framework provides the industry with a, a means to consistently monitor and verify supply chain compliance uh, to these requirements. So the task group itself, um, it's made up of numerous OEMs and suppliers, some of which, which are listed here. Um, you may recognize them. Um, and uh, participation by as many OEMs and suppliers in the industry as possible is, is what we want. Um, the more people that participate in this, uh, the more buy-in it has and uh, the more quickly it will be a success in the industry. Um, so typically, uh, anyone who's participating in the task group will send their uh, their, their finest subject matter experts um, in heat treatment uh, to uh, periodic task group meetings. Um, and together, uh, these experts uh, pool their knowledge and uh, develop the audit uh, criteria and the processing control criteria that the industry wants to use. Um, and we release these checklists that are used during audits. Um, additionally, uh, the task group is responsible for um, vetting and approving uh, knowledgeable and skilled auditors um, that will actually go out and perform audits on behalf of the industry. Um, and uh, I mean, it's great we are able to get uh, fantastically skilled uh, heat treat auditors that uh, instead of working for just one company doing uh, one company's uh, special process audits, uh, the entire industry can benefit um, from their knowledge and uh, and ability to observe um, heat treatments for everyone. Um, once audits are performed, uh, the task group reviews uh, the results of the audit, and uh, we work with the supplier uh, to resolve any corrections or corrective actions that are required. Ultimately, uh, if everything looks good by the end of this process, uh, the task group itself, so members of the industry, um, provide the approval to, uh, to actually uh, give accreditation to a particular supplier. Um, and so the most important thing about this task group is that it's industry managed. The industry really maintains full control over it and sets the direction for how medical device wants to uh, implement process control over heat treatment or any of the other processes covered by Medicred. Um, from an OEM perspective, um, it's uh, been very beneficial to us. Um, it allows us to uh, establish sourcing decisions um, that uh, that have some um, real weight behind them, so we can put our highest criticality parts with our best suppliers, um, and we know that suppliers are at a certain level by their Medicred status. Um, and also, it allows us to efficiently manage um, our own high quality um, heat treat supply chain. Um, we're able to leverage all the experience of the task group and, uh, and our hired auditors um, to know that uh, uh, our supply chain is being uh, uh, looked at very closely and uh, very well from a technical perspective. Um, and it'll ultimately reduce the amount of resources internally that we need to spend dealing with uh, quality issues that come up um, as a result of improper heat treatment. Um, and from the supplier perspective, I'll let Ed uh, discuss that a little bit. So in the case of uh, uh, supplier perspective, the uh, Metacred audit is uh, unlike a general quality system audit, goes right to the heart of a supplier's technical capability for the commodity that's being audited. And it assures that uh, through uh, rigorous technical standards and uh, highly qualified auditors that uh, what is found at the supplier will demonstrate uh, strict compliance or not, as the case may be, uh, that will help ensure final product quality and uh, thereby lead to improved manufacturing operations. This is a truly uh, technically difficult uh, endeavor on the part of the supplier. It requires a great deal of preparation. And, uh, but at the end of the day, you really do know that you have your process and control once you become accredited. And with that, I'll go to the question and answer session. Great, thank you. Looks like we do have a couple questions here. Um, the first one, can any of the presenters comment on the heat treating of nitinol? I hope I'm saying that right. 
Um, and specifically, you know, any of your experiences or um, concerns related to the particular processes. Sorry, you were all muted. Well, yeah, maybe probably Bruce has some, uh, if has some idea of nitinol is Marcel here. I do not have no knowledge of nitinol while heat treating. Thank you. Yeah, unfortunately, um, while Stryker does work with night and all, uh, it hasn't been part of my uh, daily job for a while, so I, I don't have a lot to say on that uh, right now. Yeah, and, and my exposure has been pretty limited. I'm actually currently studying the product for a customer that's bringing a new product line to us, <clears throat> but I can't say that I know enough to speak intelligently to it at this time. Thank you. Um, what do you feel any of you are the biggest exposures from heat treating gone wrong? I guess what are the kind of worst case scenarios from not um, adhering to best practices with regard to this critical process? Well, I can't say that in my job I've run into that uh, just yet. We have had failures in heat treatment that were discovered and short stop before they got much further down the uh, supply chain, but I'm not aware that we've had anything escape to the level of patient or uh, doctor use. Great, thank you. I think that's a good thing. Um, and lastly, Marcel, I think it was you that distinguished the MediCard audit between a typical quality system audit, but could you kind of take us through those differences one more time? Or any of you that have been through the process? Yeah, I'll, I'll be happy to take a shot. This is at Englehard. Um, a quality management system audit is uh, pretty much establishes an operating system uh, for which you can control, measure, and document the uh, quality uh, of your operation as it results in, in producing a product. And you can look at it as an inch deep and a mile wide across your organization. Whereas a Metacred audit goes very much to the heart of the commodity that you're auditing, whether it's heat treating or sterilization or uh, some other specialized critical process, and all of the time is devoted to just how you do the process, whether you are in compliance or not, and should you be found out of compliance, it's very rigorous uh, root cause corrective action to recover and assure that uh, you don't go out of compliance again. So we look at a Metacred audit as an inch wide and a mile deep into the technical standard. Okay. Now I, I'd like is Marcel. I'd like to add That's something good. to Edward. Okay. So I'm I'm performing audits myself, and I just want to, to tell you how depth is the the Metacred audit is the fact that if you have a customer requirement and you want even to be, be uh, beyond that requirement, to be tighter than the customer requirement. We're going to look to your requirement, to internal requirements, okay, because they are tighter now and they become number one requirement. So you have not only to meet the customer requirement, but now you need to meet your internal requirement. So it's very, very in-depth looking everywhere, uh, it's an expression we are looking under the carpet, okay? It's different, really is different than your customer audit, is different than the a quality system audit. It's a very, very detailed audit to the product, to the requirements, to the procedures, to the testings, to everything, everything that you might think of it. Thank you. It looks like we've got one more question in. Um, you still have a chance to submit. It's just using that little box on the bottom right-hand corner and submit your question to all panelists. Um, this last question, I'm guessing it's for you, Bruce, um, from the OEM perspective. Uh, you mentioned that you know you had you through ascertaining who is Medicred audited, you would be able to sort of prioritize your um, suppliers and your contract manufacturers by those that are accredited. Does Stryker have any plans to um, only contract with MedAccredited, med -accredited, 
organizations, or how else do you plan to implement that process in your supplier controls? So Stryker's implementation strategy for Metacred um, is still being developed, and um, it will be uh, many years before a comprehensive um, strategy is, is is rolled out across the entire supply chain. Um, and really, that's uh, that's all I want to comment on there. I mean, we're still working that out internally, exactly uh, exactly how we will handle it. But it will certainly give us a a, a tool to uh, uh, minimize risk on critical products. Perfect. Thanks so much. Um, that does conclude the question and answer session. We got a lot of great questions. And thank you to our speakers because it was really nice to have the industry and the PRI um, engineer perspective on, on how this program works and how this critical manufacturing process works. So thank you very much.